Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast. Today we have a special podcast with Tom Rosenbauer of Orvis Fly Fishing. Unlike most of our guests, Tom is not a fishing captain. However, Tom has become a household name in the fishing community after 30 plus years of working with Orvis, publishing and producing books, instructionals, podcasts, videos, and more. On top of being an avid learner who is known for his curiosity, Tom is also a chocolate maker and an all-around fun guy to listen to. In this podcast, we discuss his background with Orvis, what makes great outdoorsmen, and what he has learned from decades of teaching others. If you're enjoying this podcast, please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review and rating. That helps us continue to spread the word. And as always, there's no greater advertisement than the word of mouth. So please continue to share with others. We hope that you enjoy this fun and insightful interview. Thank you for listening. This is the Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. Uh, he, he, right. tried he tried it. He tried it. Hit him. Hit him. Hit him. Hit him. He got him. He's on. Got uh, two butt caps off the rods. Filled him with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the. He's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. And he turned around. He said, "You talk so much, you're like a senator." Hey Tom, thanks for making time and joining us on the podcast today. Sure, Hunter. I have. Uh, I'm a little. Um, I'm a little. Uh, feel a little insecure because I'm. I'm not a captain, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and never and never have been. So. Um, well, the, the nature of the podcast, what we're trying to do with it is travel around and learn from fishing guides. And we have the asterisk there and other industry leaders. And when we think about, you know, traveling around and learning from people and hopefully trying to pass that on, it obviously makes a lot of sense to sit down with you because your background the past 30 years, that's kind of been what you were doing before podcast and uh, everything else. <laughs> uh, but you might have the longest running fishing podcast that I know of. I think it's almost 10 years now. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I don't know if mine is the longest because I know Zach Matthews has had one for a long time. You know, itinerant angler, and then um, ask about trout in Colorado. Those guys have been around a long time, so I'm not sure if it is the longest running. But yeah, it's been around for a while. <laughs> yeah, and you've been working. We'll, we'll get into the bio, but you've been kind of working in the instructional side of fishing for almost 30 years. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I kind of, I kind of really found my niche um, as as someone who um, is, I guess, non threatening to novices and and helping to introduce them to really the basics of fly fishing. That's kind of kind of my thing. Um, the podcast, most of the quest, most of the questions I answer are relatively basic. I, I do get into the geeky stuff sometimes, and people appreciate that. But you know, I I, I know by the questions that I get asked that it's, it's pretty basic stuff. Well, I would love to just start off by hearing about how you kind of got connected to Orvis, and then what the journey has been like the past thirty years working with them. <laughs> well, as a I, as a kid growing up obsessed with fly fishing, uh, I started when I was I don't know. 11 maybe i've been a fisherman all my life my father and i fished together uh worm fishing for bullheads and and uh, white perch on uh, lake ontario and mm. i i decided from you know reading stuff in field and stream and watching the american sportsmen back in the 60s that the fly fishing stuff looked looked like fun it looked kind of cool mm -hmm. um and so i taught myself and through you know the the very few books that were around and um hacked through it for for many years um you know I, i'm embarrassed how long it took me to figure out things like casting <laughs> and and blood knots and all that stuff but i was a pretty decent fly tire and a, a guy that had a little local fly shop an orvis dealer um asked me to tie some flies for his shop. And so when I was, I don't know, 14, I started tying commercially mm. and did that 
did that through high school and college, and I taught some fly tying classes at a uh, uh, tackle shop in downtown Syracuse. I went to the forestry school there. And so, you know, and then he had a, the same guy had a, it was an amazing place. It was uh, right in downtown, uh, er, real, very urban area. And, you know, one, one minute I would be showing a guy a Orvis bamboo rod and the next minute I would be bagging minnows or going (laughs) down the base, going down the basement and counting worms into styrofoam containers. (laughs) Um, but I did teach some fly tying classes there and, uh. And of course, I've, I had gotten the Orvis news for many, many years. The old, the old uh, uh, periodical, you know, the newsprint thing. And there was a job opening when I graduated from college with a bachelor's degree. Not much you can do with a bachelor's degree in biology. Um, I had planned to go to grad school, and so I thought I'd work for a couple of years, try to work for Orvis because I love fly fishing, and um, then go back to grad school and get a master's and maybe teach or, you know, be a biologist in the field. And um, I started out in the retail store as a clerk. Uh, I was terrible at it. I'm terrible at retail. Just not a good salesman or? Yeah, well, uh, I I can be a pretty good salesman now, but uh, just not, I don't have the patience for dealing with (laughs) that, that kind of stuff. And in those days, you know, in those days, fly fishing was not as uh, populist a sport. It was, it was a bunch of old, white, pretty pretentious people who fly fished. You know, this is mm-hmm. back in the early 70s. Um, and it wasn't much fun waiting, being a surf to those people. Yeah. Of course, fly fishing is different. And being a kid that came from a modest background, it was it was not exactly a comfortable situation for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I never went to a country club or went to a prep school, and you know, it's just it just wasn't wasn't my thing. So, luckily, a job opened up running the fly department. Um, back then, we had all domestic fly tires. They were. Um, all, all men, I believe. Yeah, they were all men. There were about you know, 25 of them uh, distributed across the country, and somebody needed to manage them, check the quality, send them materials, place orders with them. And so I, you know, I got to work with really cool people like Dick Bittner and um, Joe King and mm. Renee Harrop was one of our tires. Uh, Dennis Black, who started Umpqua, was one of the tires. Oh, cool! Uh, and um, you know, it was uh, it was really uh, it was really an interesting experience. Um, then, uh, then I, I was I was pretty young and wet behind the ears, and wasn't really um, mature enough to handle that. So they moved me into the fishing school. I got a lot of breaks here. <laughs> Yeah, I got a lot. Of, I got a, they. They were pretty patient with me. I got a lot of breaks. Yeah. Um, and then I then I moved into the fishing school as an instructor and did that for a number of years, fishing and shooting schools. And during the summer or during the winter, when there was no fishing schools, I would work on on the telephone, taking orders and uh, doing customer service calls, uh, which was uh, which was fun. It was interesting. And then uh, you know, then I got into. Uh, Got into writing. Um, Perk Perkins, who was uh, who was the son of the at that time the president, was doing the Orvis News, editing it, and he was uh, going to move out to San Francisco to open the first non-Manchester, Vermont Orvis store, the mm-hmm. first one that wasn't on site. And he said, "Hey, you want to edit the Orvis News?" And I said, sure, for how long? And he said, well, for good. I'm going to California. <laughs> <laughs> he just left it with uh, you? <laughs> yeah, I had no journalism background, no editing skills, uh, no photography skills. And uh, I kind of kind of just taught myself how to write, You know, got a lot of books on writing and editing. And at the time, both Fly Rod and Reel and Fly Fisherman were here in, Man- in the Manchester area, so I would 
those guys took me under their wing. People like John Randolph and John Barstow and Carl Navre and John Merwin, Silvio Calabi, the editors then would, you know, I'd go and hang out in their offices and ask them to critique stuff and got a lot of great, um, got a lot of great advice uh, mm-hmm. from them on writing and editing and photography. Hmm. And I worked with a couple local studio photographers and, you know, learned a lot of skills by watching them. And um, then Nick Lyons asked me to write a book uh, on fly fishing. Nick's no dummy. He, you know, knew that an Orvis fly fishing book would do well regardless of whatever monkey wrote it (laughs) because, (laughs) because of Orvis's name and distribution. And he was very patient with me, and I wrote my first book in 1984 and then just kept going. And see, it, you're right. It seems like you, you caught a lot of great breaks, but it I is— I did. I did. I, I caught a lot of great breaks. And, you know, I, for, a, for a, a kid with not many talents at all, <laughs> other than I knew how to fly fish, uh, I caught a lot of good breaks. And I'm, I'm so grateful to um, Orvis, the— the Perkins family, especially for for giving me um, giving me all these breaks when they probably should have fired me numerous times, <laughs> and they threatened they threatened to a couple times. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I I've always thought it was interesting too with all the different kind of publications you've done, the podcast that you've had running, the online. You, you, from my understanding, you know that's been the main kind of niche in the company for the majority of your time is trying to help people learn more about fly fishing and also introduce them to different products. Is is that still what you're currently doing at Orvis or? Have yeah, you- yeah. It, no, it really is, and I'm moving more into that more as a you know kind of a a spokesperson. Um, I sincerely believe that. Um, the most important thing a, a company can do uh, these days is to uh, develop trust with mm. the customer. I mean, even more than brand loyalty, there's a difference, I think, between brand loyalty and brand trust. Mm. And with all the noise that's out there in the electronic world, um, you know, people need an anchor. They need they need somebody to uh, to vet the information they get. Hmm. And I try to do that. Um, it, I also love it. I mean, it's not just a business decision. I love doing it. It's so you know, it's so satisfying when somebody says that they listen to something on the podcast and they went out fishing and it helped catch a couple fish. I mean, that's really cool stuff. Yeah, and it, it's kind of neat too because in some ways it's led you to a life filled with learning. And that was one of the things I I wanted to ask you about. So. Obviously, you've been involved in the educational side of the fishing industry for a long time. What has it taught you at the macro level? Or, and we can maybe move to some of the micro level, but at the macro level, what has it taught you about teaching others? Um, keep it simple. Don't use jargon. Mm. Uh, hmm. R- never forget what it was like when you were learning to do this stuff. You know, you have to back up and Mm. say, okay, what was I like when I was 15 years old and I was trying to understand this stuff? Mm. Um, You know, people overthink fly fishing for sure. We all overthink it. (laughs) And it's not that hard, really. I mean, it's relatively, but it can be very complex and there's a lot of variables. But... when you get down to it, you're trying to stick a hook in a fish's mouth. Um, and uh, just, you know, remembering what it was like when, when you were learning and, yeah. and then using that knowledge to explain things to people. And that's kind of full circle with you trying to figure out fly fishing somewhat on your own. It sounds like there's a fly shop and you were fishing some with your dad, but is that kind of what's been driving you is just kind of still envisioning yourself when you first started? Yeah. I mean, I, I learn every time I go out, people say, oh, in your book, you said this. And in your podcast, you said something totally different. Well, yeah, duh. I, I'm learning <laughs> just like you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have a right to change my opinion because I learn new stuff. Yeah. 
Well, and I, I found in life too that, I mean, even, even running the podcast and having to learn about some gear and learning about some of the technical things, it, it also kind of produces a humility, you know, being the, being the newbie. And it's also a lot of fun though, because you're, 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 the whole world is right in front of you to open up all sorts of new techniques and ideas. Did you always kind of find it fun to be learning, to be new in different types of fishing or different settings? Yeah, um, uh, a friend of mine, Paul Fearson, did a, a kind of a little essay on me for something we're doing on the website, and he's an old fishing buddy and duck hunting buddy, and we, you know, very close. We've known each other for years, and he said, "You know what the most, you know what the 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 best part about you is is that you're always curious." Hmm. You know, he said, "You you you wonder why." If we're using alternating current, why light bulbs don't flicker? And you you went and and you and you did a lot of research to figure out why light bulbs don't flicker when there's alternating current going through them. He says that's you know that's the kind of that's just the way you approach things. You're always curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the teaching side and just trying to learn things, but then also teach other things. If if you and I were going out to the stream today and you were going to try to teach me, and let's just say that I've never done freshwater trout fishing, how would yeah. you approach trying to teach me and help me understand what's happening? Uh, I wouldn't take you trout fishing. I would start you on a, a, a sunfish pond, and I wouldn't give you a casting lesson. I would take you out to the end of the dock where there's some sunfish, and I would say, okay, see those fish down there? you got to fly at the end of there, get it out to the fish, and hook one. And I wouldn't give you much advice. I'd let you figure out a little bit. Hmm. Let, I'd let you dap. I'd let you thrash around. And I'd let you see what's involved in trying to hook a fish on a fly. Only then would I give you a casting lesson because mm. now now you know how to put it into context. You know, we we tend to teach people how to fly cast before they even know why they're flailing back and forth with this line. Mm. And then we, and then we take them on the water, right? But it's really that's really backwards. Um you need you need to be a kid first. You need to be a kid uh, hanging off the end of a dock, watching fish and and dipping your fly in the water, and then figuring out okay, there's a fish thirty feet away. How do I get my fly out to that fish? And then it all makes sense, mm-hmm. right? It makes more sense. And only after doing that would I take you out on a trout stream, and I'd probably, hopefully, the fish would respond to a swung wet fly. And I just put a I just put a little nymph or a wet fly on the end and let you kind of hang it in the current. Yeah, is the idea of that just to have fun, but then also just to kind of get your feet wet and make it a little bit more real because it's on the water versus just trying to go out in the yard or go out in a field somewhere and create all these scenarios and get everything right. I mean, what's the the big kind of gist behind that type of approach? Yeah, it's supposed to be fun. I mean, it's the way I approach it with kids. If- Mm-hmm. The kids and adults are the same. Uh, you you got to know it's fun first. And if it's just casting practice in a hot field, um, it's pretty boring. Hmm. Is there things that you do differently when you're working with adults who are maybe new to angling that than, than kids? Um, yeah, I have to be more patient. Kids learn a lot quicker. Hmm. They tend to have Adult- a lot more fun. <laughs> Yeah, adults are all they're all wigged out and they're nervous and they they, they overthink things and they overmuscle things and and kids tend to I think tend to listen better and do what you tell them. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I also was kind of curious about too is you know you've got an opportunity to experience a wide variety of fishing and different types of fishing. And, you know, I think you've published over 10 plus books. Is that right? Uh, I think it's, it's over 20, but I, over I, 20, lose, huh? I lose, I lose count. <laughs> I, uh, some of them I'd like, some of them I'd like to forget. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but definitely, you know, spend some time traveling around and learning different types of fishing. I mean, what have you learned about learning for lack of a better phrase 
when you're trying to teach things and figure things out yourself? What have I learned about learning? Hmm, that's a tough one. Well, you, you, you can't throw a lot of things at someone. You know, fly fishing is, is kind of complex. And you have to take things one step at a time. I mean, that's pretty basic for learning anything. But mm -hmm. you really got to gotta give it to someone in bite-sized pieces. Mm -hmm. And so you have to kind of try to limit the variables in the, the situation where you're teaching. That's why I like to start on a, a sunfish pond because you don't have current. And, um, you know, the fish aren't usually move, moving like most saltwater fish are. Um, and uh, you just have to try to limit the variables and take it one step at a time so that it registers with someone. And, and do you sit down and actually try to, for yourself, when you're going to film something, record something, write a book, do you actually outline kind of a sequence that you think is most important for you to figure out or or record or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. When uh, we're in the process of doing a, a second season of the Orvis TV show, which will become uh, more content for the Learning Center, and it, most TV shows, fishing TV shows, you go to a site and you go fishing with a guide and you take it as it comes and you tell a story about the fishing, right? Mm -hmm. when, when we go for the Orvis show to a particular site, we say, okay, this can't be a typical guide day. These are the shots we need to get. And I've got a list and I've got a vision for how they're going to unfold. It doesn't always work that way. And, um, we have to do this and this and this and this and this. And, um, and, uh, you know, if we don't get it, we don't get it. We'll try it another day or go someplace else. But, um, you know, we go with a, a very scripted, uh, uh, list of things to do. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with my books. There's always an outline. It has to be an outline, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's usually written out in pencil on a piece of paper. And then, then it goes to, uh, to a Word document or an Excel sheet. I use Excel for, um, for keeping track of illustrations and photos and Word for, for the text. Um, and then it goes from an outline to fleshing it out. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things, too, we have a lot of people who listen to this podcast and they want to, obviously, they're listening to a podcast where we interview captains and fishing industry leaders, and they definitely want to learn. And uh -huh. something that yep. kind of stood out to me that you said, and I've experienced this myself, is there's just, there's no shortage with the internet today. I mean, it's a long way from when you said there were just a few books. Now there's thousands and thousands and thousands of books and different podcasts, TV shows, YouTube, all yeah. of that. Yeah. How do you, how do you try to, you know, if you're an angler, if you're, or you're a fishing captain or a guide or an angler and you are trying to learn, you're trying to get better, but how do you try to sift through all that so that it also just doesn't become stressful and overwhelming with how much information is out there? Is there thoughts on that? Yeah. And some of it's not great information. You know, I, I, um, I think that that people need to they need to go to a trusted source whether it's an author or a podcaster or a YouTube person and they have to they have to sort through them and you can uh you can either trust Orvis or you can trust another brand or uh another series uh or another podcaster and ask friends you know um you know What's what are the best YouTube videos out there? What are the what are the books that that I should read? But that only goes so far, you know. It really it really comes down to fishing. As you and I know fishing a lot because mm -hmm. that's how you, that's how you learn. You you got to get out there and don't be afraid to make mistakes and thrash around and uh, don't ever let anyone tell you you're doing it wrong. I mean, my mantra is. Um, if you don't hook yourself in the eye and you don't fall in and drown, um, there's nothing else that's wrong about fly fishing. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good bar to set for a trip. Yeah. Yeah. And 
you know, with you traveling around and doing lots of different projects, when was the last time that you really felt like that kid trying to figure out fly fishing for the first time? When was the last time you really felt novice in something, whether it's with a project or a species or type of fishing? Two days ago, three days, no, it was three days ago, I was fishing in a tailwater stream uh, that has very large brown trout that I know intimately. And I had a few hours, and uh, it was a little stretch that I had never fished before. And I had to walk a ways to find fish feeding. There was a good hatch on. I knew there was going to be a good sulfur hatch. And I had to walk probably half, three-quarters of a mile to find some fish feeding. And I found a bunch of big fish feeding and feeding on the surface. And I worked those fish for three hours with you, pulling everything out of my bag of tricks and I never even got a refusal from the fish. Hmm. I never even got a, I got one fish to come and look because I could see the fish. I was in the shade, they were in the sun. So it was kind of a, it's a really good setup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they were big, they were big brown trout, like 18 inches plus, there were four or five of them. Hmm. And I walked away from those fish, never even having one refuse my fly. And, uh, you know, I felt like, I felt like I was when I was 12 years old. <laughs> I, <laughs> did you go to, a, I, did you go to a pond? <laughs> no, I didn't. And, you know, the one thing about being older is that I didn't get pissed off and depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that comes with age. <laughs> I just pictured you giving up halfway through and going to catch sunfish at the, at the sunfish no. pond. No, I I wasn't going to give up on those fish, and the only reason I left was I had to drive home um, to see my family before they went to bed. <laughs> so but how did you try to think through, like, I think everyone listening to this podcast, I mean, I'm, I'm in Florida and spend a lot of time with flats guides who are chasing tarpon and, uh, yeah. you know, permit are notoriously like that and sometimes bone yeah. fish. And, yeah. You know, and everybody's had those moments where they felt like everything was set up exactly like what you said, you know, and then they couldn't make it work. And what, what's running through your mind or how do you try to learn from that or grow from that? Um, I almost always think it's, it's presentation and not the fly. Um, whether it's, whether it's permit or tarpon or whatever, um, it's and I, and I you know I had a three hour drive home and of course I was a lot of things were going through my mind but um, it was probably I should have put on a super long tippet and I should have gotten way above those fish and thrown my fly way above them so that it drifted down without drag and the fly came first because I I realized that those fish never rose right after I cast my fly so they were they were skittish you know they're highly pressured fish which is you know can be a problem with with tarpon or permit um you know the more pressured they get the harder they get they just know we're there and um you got to be you got to be at the top of your game and i would have i would have changed my angle of approach and changed my leader um and uh, you know similar situation with with bonefish or tarpon uh i don't i don't think it's often the fly it's it's the way we present it the way we move the fly or don't move the fly I, i'm a i'm a big presentationist i don't mm-hmm. you know people wig out about fly patterns and think there's going to be this magic fly pattern and i think i had all the flies in my box that that could have worked mm-hmm. so do you have like a way that you do you write things down or make notes or do you just try to kind of keep it all in your head and internalize it I am really shitty about keeping a fishing log, and my <laughs> wife keeps telling me to do that. And I used to, and I do it irregularly, but it for it, it somehow removes the pleasure for me to keep a fishing mm-hmm. log. And I should have written this stuff down, um, and and I will because that I learned a lot that day. I learned, I learned five or six really important things that day. 
Um, and I should write that down. If I'm in the middle of a book, I will take notes, but only specific to what I'm writing about. Mm-hmm. And I will keep lo- I will keep logs if I'm in the middle of a book, uh, because you know the anecdotal stuff is what people really love. Mm-hmm. Um, in these how-to books, I mean, a how-to book is basically an instruction manual, and it's not that much fun to read. And that's all I do. I don't do, I don't do flowery essays or, uh, you know, experiences and yeah, and the romance of fly fishing. I don't, I'm a nuts and bolts guy, yeah. uh, but you have to you have to throw in some some anecdotal stuff to make it relevant and interesting for people. Yeah, and I've asked people about that because there's there's plenty of apps and different note note keeping apps, and some people have written journals. But at the end of the day, I, I call it phone fatigue. But you know, there's an app for everything that you want there to be an app for. But then sometimes <laughs> you just don't feel like going on every time you fish on your phone and writing stuff down. And you know, yeah. I, I don't really know if there's really a silver bullet in uh, in in trying to write these things out outside of just internalizing them too and and trying to learn from them. But it's always an interesting question. But I've actually I've yet to meet anybody that really felt very confident in in their their note taking and, and journaling. Yeah, I've met a few people that are pretty diligent and pretty good about it, but um, you know, I can't even. I hate doing things on my phone. I hate phones, mm-hmm. and I, my notes are all uh, on a pad with pencil. Mm-hmm. It's just you know, I'm older. I'm more comfortable with that, with that, um, with that process. Yeah. Out of all the different types of fishing that you've done over the years, like I know you've done carp and trout and, of course, saltwater. And I remember mm-hmm. actually when I first started saltwater fly fishing, uh, I actually remember watching a YouTube video that you did. <laughs> and it was mm-hmm. an instructional and it was about intercepting the fish and uh, uh-huh. fl- fly casting. Out of all of that, what have you found to be the most challenging fish to try to target? Challenging. Oh, boy. It, you know, it, it varies um brown trout obviously <laughs> based on the other day <laughs> um i have found tarpon to be to be challenging at times you know fishing off boca grande and in, in july <laughs> is uh, <laughs> and trying to get a tarpon to eat is uh it is can be really challenging and frustrating mm-hmm. um bonefish at times uh, bonefish can be can be pretty tough. Carp mm. can be tough. Carp can be amazingly difficult to catch. I don't even throw permit in there because you know, as Steve Huff is always saying, they're dishonest fish. And <laughs> you, you, you know, I, I I don't even care about permit. I'm sorry, but they're they're just they're just too weird for me. You know, a bonefish, you can figure them out and do something with. Even a brown trout, you can figure out carp. You can you can figure it out eventually, but I, I don't know about permit. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of like the nonstop day, the never-ending day of brown trout you had a few days ago. Yeah, I mean, I'll throw to a permit if they're around, but I, I wouldn't plan a whole trip around permit. I'm sorry, but they're just they're just too weird for me. Yeah, well— you you still travel and you still move around and do lots of different species. What in what ways has that helped you as an angler having all these different experiences? What has it taught you across the board? Oh, just I mean, time on the water is the most important thing, and and having fun and and you know fishing with a buddy and telling stories about the weird people you meet. Um, it just I mean, Carp fishing helps me with my trout fishing because they're so spooky and they don't see that well. And and brown trout fishing helps me with my carp fishing and my bone fishing. So just just time on the water, you know, fishing for sunfish. It's 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 all it's all good. And you just fish as much as you can, even if it's not your chosen species um, or your chosen spot. You just get out there with a rod and a fly just as often as you can. Hmm. Is, is, are there any stories over the past few years of putting together books and videos and podcasts? Are there any stories that are kind of like your greatest hits, trips, or, or things that you feel like you'll never forget experiences? Um, hmm. 
No, it's it's usually just the more the most recent, the mm. most recent thing. I had some, I had some, I had that frustrating brown trout fishing the other day. I'll remember that for a while, <laughs> but then last week uh, I was I was carp fishing on the Hudson River, and um, had a really good day of catching carp on mulberries falling into the water and fishing a dry fly to these, you know. 12 to 15 pound carp that was pretty exciting um but yeah i i don't there's there's no standouts really Mm -hmm. with with you guys being involved in like educating and trying to help people understand fishing sometimes you know you mentioned when you were younger and you were working in in the store you struggled with some of the the snootiness or you know just kind of the looking down upon that that can sometimes exist in fishing culture. But I found that to be true in some ways for outdoor culture in general. I think sometimes people want to be secretive. Sometimes people uh, don't want to see more outdoorsmen and and women getting into the different sports. How, how, how have you tried to combat that with, with the influence that you have? How have you tried to help people not be that way and remove that stigma? Well, it's, it's it's mostly a matter of people not willing to explore and not willing to walk uh, or or row or put their boat in a place where not everybody else puts their boat in. Um, things are crowded, but there are not any more fly fishermen around today. I mean, there might be a few more, but it's not. It's not growing by huge leaps and bounds. And people that complain about crowds are the ones that go to the same place that everybody else does. Hmm. I can find a spot on the most heavily fished trout streams in the east where I can't see anybody because I'm willing to walk. And I'm willing to, you know, know where the drift boats are going to put in and where they're going to take out, and I can... um, you know, either if I'm in a boat, I can I can uh, change the schedule so that I'm not putting in the same place the same time as everybody else. Or if I'm waiting, I can move around them. And if I'm saltwater fishing, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try a spot or I'll suggest that uh, charter boat captain try a spot that eh, is maybe not maybe not as concentrated with fish as as um, other places but you can you're going to have it to yourself and the fish aren't pressured they aren't spooked as much and you have a better chance of catching them so you know just just being will be being willing to explore and not go to the places that you read about in the magazines or see on tv shows or youtube or whatever Mm mm-hmm well, I'd love to, as we kind of wrap up towards the back end here, I'd love just to shoot off some fun rapid fire ones. You're known for always doing a Q and a on your podcast, which is always really fun. And then I've seen some on YouTube and Facebook live as well, but I'd love just to pick your brain on some of these things and feel free to go off on any tangents you want to. Okay, great. Well, I would love to know what is the most fun part about your job? Uh, the people. What's the, what about just working with them, traveling with them? Yeah, yeah, the people here. Um, You know, I I, I spend a lot of time with uh, the product developers because I used to be in charge of product development, and I love product development, and I work very closely uh, with the product developers, the men and women that that design the rods and the clothing and the waders and flies and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just such a cool bunch of people um Mm. who are really passionate and i enjoy fishing with them on our off time and enjoy working with them and look forward to coming in the office every day because i just work with a lot of really great people that are sicko fly fishers and Mm. bird hunters and turkey hunters Mm. What would what advice would you give to somebody who just says they they can't make enough time or they can't find enough time to fish but they want to? Well, that's total bullshit. You got to prioritize, and there's always more important things to do than to go fishing. But if if it's important to you, you make time, mm. and, and it's and it's healthy. Mm. If you don't have time to go fishing, your life is unhealthy, and you're you're not going to live as long, and you're not going to lead 
lead as satisfying a life if that's the way you look at life. Hmm. And, you know, um, m- maybe it's maybe you don't drive two hours to go trout fishing or you don't uh, fly to Florida to go tarpon fishing. You go to a neighborhood pond and fish for sunfish or catfish or carp or whatever. Hmm. But a- anybody can find the time. And if you can't find the time, then you better think about Think about the way your life is going. Mm. So you travel a lot and fish. What tips do you have for making trips and traveling with fishing? Uh, hmm. Listen to the guide. Mm. Listen to your guide. If you don't have a guide, uh, do your research beforehand. You know, I mean, it look on the web do your research on the web um and and go to a lot of sites go to a lot of fish report sites and a lot of fly shop sites and and look at what's going on and then when you get there go to the nearest fly shop um buy something because it's hard way to make a living Mm -hmm. and then ask questions Mm. do you have any tips to just a follow-up on trying to make trips as affordable as possible um, as affordable as possible. Eat a lot of nuts and granola. I find that I find that a few bags of nuts will last me all day, and I don't need to eat dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that about you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like stopping to eat. Yeah, and and nuts will fill you up, and they're relatively healthy. So mm. <laughs> I just came back from a fishing trip where you know. I basically ate nuts and beef jerky and a little fruit. <laughs> um, uh, it's as affordable as possible. Well, you know, you can camp. You can sleep in your truck. Uh, it's not an expensive sport. It doesn't have to be. Mm-hmm. So I, I got a little bit of a hard turn here, but I was interested in it. So you recently got into chocolate making. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. How, About four, four or five years ago. How did that come about? Oh, it's a. Uh, I've always loved chocolate. Who doesn't? Or there are a few people. Aaron Adams doesn't like chocolate. He's the he's the weirdest fishing buddy I have. I love fishing with Aaron from <laughs> Bonefish Tarpon Trust. But he doesn't like chocolate. He's the only fishing buddy I have that doesn't like chocolate. But his wife likes it, so I bring it for her. Um, and my son has a, a severe peanut allergy, and he couldn't really eat any chocolate because most of it's made on uh where there could be cross contamination there's nuts in the in the factory so i thought i'd make chocolate and i hacked away at all these shortcuts um that were less than uh, less than delicious and i finally found this website called chocolate alchemy in oregon uh, where a guy named john nancy has figured out how to make real smooth, high-end artisan chocolate in your kitchen. And it's about a, you know, it's about a $500 investment, so I agonized about it for the machines that you need. Mm-hmm. And I finally, my wife just convinced me to do it. She said, it's wintertime. You you know, why don't you try it? So I did, and I just loved it. I loved, I love experimenting with different beans because every, every cocoa bean, it's like wines or beer or coffee, every cocoa bean from every region has a different flavor and mm-hmm. uh, you know it's just fun to experiment and people love it i you know i've never sold a bar it's damn good chocolate i'm telling you it's i make real i much better chocolate maker than i am fly tire um but i've never sold a bar i give it i give it away to friends and uh yeah that's how that's how i got into it it's a process it's you got to be committed to it like like fly fishing yeah and it is fun to learn something new which seems to yeah. be a, a thread for you yeah i mean i th- i think that's how you stay young and that's how you stay alert and uh keep your mind going is to to still learn new things mm. i love learning new software editing programs for photography and video you know just mm. because i know it's it's good for me to and you feel and you feel good about yourself. Mm-hmm. Are Are there any other interests outside of fishing that you have that's unrelated to what you're doing with Orvis? Uh yeah. I like to I like to uh, 
hike around and look for wild mushrooms with my family. Hmm. Um, I, lo- I like ver- different kinds of music. I love live music, and we go to everything from with my 14-year-old son, my wife and 14-year-old son. I would go everything from rock concerts to uh, classical orchestras. Hmm. Um, yeah. In what ways has fishing positively impacted your family and your family dynamic? I don't know if it's positively affected my family dynamic because my wife and son don't fish. Mm. Um, but uh, they understand, they're understanding, and they understand that it's my, it's my professional life and my personal life and my passion. Mm-hmm. And you have to find the right wife, the right, right spouse, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, I, th- I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's positively affected my family life. Just it's what I do. It's mm-hmm. it's in my DNA, right? It's it's just part of me. And uh, you know, if I didn't fish, I'd probably be home more often. <laughs> yeah, but you haven't pushed it on them, which is interesting. It, it you know that if if your son doesn't like it or your wife doesn't like it, that you know that's okay. Is that is that you, kind of been you your can't, approach? Yeah, you can't push it on someone. It's it's not going to take, and they're. They're not going to enjoy it. My fishing time is my time alone or time with the boys mm-hmm. or the girls sometimes. Um, but it's, you know, everybody needs a, a time away from their family too. So um, I, I'd love to share it with them, but they don't care about it. Mm-hmm. And my my wife and son love the outdoors. They love nature. We take a lot of hikes and stuff, but they just don't like fishing. So um, yeah. that's that's the way it is. From your experience over the years of hanging out with a lot of people in the fishing industry, you're obviously super well connected there and you've been around a lot of different captains and guides and Mm -hmm, et mm -hmm. et cetera. We could go on and on, but what do you believe makes a great angler? Observation. Hmm. Observation, picking up patterns, Um, learning from one situation, scenario, and applying it to another. And, and registering, you know, thinking about why was that fish there? Why did that fish eat? And why did the other fish not eat? It's just observation. Hmm. What do you think are some misconceptions of what makes great anglers? Oh, I think that uh, people think that great anglers are born hmm. and, and not made. You know, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours is, uh, is pretty valid. In mm-hmm. fishing, I think. Um, Could you explain that a, a little bit more? The ten thousand hours. Well, it's just that Malcolm Gladwell did, you know, did the book called Outliers, and he he realized that nobody he he didn't think that anybody was a was a child prodigy or uh, a, a genius at a particular thing. They had all spent one way or another about ten thousand hours learning, whether it was Bill Gates or you know a concert violinist. Um, they had they had put in their time. Mm-hmm. What's the story behind bringing beadhead flies to North America? I've heard this referenced uh, a couple times. Yeah. Um, well, when I was when I was doing product development, I had um, I had gotten this uh, uh, videotape. I think it was probably a Betamax uh, from a guy named Roman Mosier in Austria. And in this video, it was all in German, so I didn't understand. Even though I'm German extraction, I didn't understand it. But I, but I watched the video, and I saw these flies that he was tying with, with brass beads on the head. And I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. You know, it's a way to get a little sparkle and weight. So I, John Harder uh, at the time was running the fly department. And we got some brass beads from, I think it was Worth Tackle, you know, for making spinning lures. And we stuck them on some hooks and tied some nymphs behind them, like I saw in the video. And, uh, you know, I, honestly, I kind of I kind of tied a bunch of them up and then filed them away in my fly box. And I gave them to friends. And all of a sudden, my friends were coming back saying, Jesus Christ 
those flies really work. And I thought, <laughs> hmm, maybe maybe I should use them too. <laughs> but, I, you know, I hadn't given them a hard enough try, but my friends had. And um, just, you know, then I said, well, we should be selling these flies. They really work good. And we, uh, you know, we sold a lot of beadhead flies. Umqua, at about the same time, started selling beadhead flies. And then... Um, we came up with uh, tungsten beads, hmm. and uh, which are heavier than brass, and and don't have any potential for toxicity in the water. Brass hmm. apparently has a tiny bit of lead in it or something, mm-hmm. um, and tungsten is inert, and it's heavier, so it's actually more efficient. Hmm. My my last two questions here. Uh, the the next one is if you could put one thing on a billboard for every angler to see. What would it be? Can I swear? Sure. <laughs> Stay out of my fucking space. <laughs> people crowding. You know, yeah, people crowding. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's on a whether it's on a tarpon tarpon flat or a bonefish flat or a trout stream, mm. um, people. And it's not. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get up on my soapbox now. It's not the young kids who don't know any better. I hear that all the time. The old guys, oh, these young kids don't know ethics. They don't know uh, etiquette on the stream. That's bullshit because the old guys are the ones that are always crowding me, the old Mm. experienced guys. The young kids are much more conscientious and considerate. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking mainly on trout streams. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the old guys who, you know, I've always fished there, and I want to fish that pool right there. Mm-hmm. The, the young kids are a lot better mm-hmm. at at being conscientious and caring about uh, other people's space on the water. Yeah, and that ties back to what you were saying about putting in the time to actually just either walk further, boat further, or putting in the time to actually learn something for yourself and trying to go out. And um, it's a lot easier to dump off and an area and just know one area. And if someone's there, then you don't know anything else to do or so. Yeah, exactly. You're going to learn so much by exploring and exploring is half the fun. Mm -hmm. In my, in my view, anyways, I love exploring and finding new water. Mm -hmm. The last question is, are there any particular projects that you're excited about that are coming up for you? Um, Yeah. um, Finishing this uh, second season of the TV show, um, you know, it's going to be a little more advanced than the first season is, is on Amazon prime. Now, if people are curious about what it's all about, it's a teaching show, mm-hmm. strictly a teaching show and it's on Amazon prime. It's on YouTube. You know, you can find it on the Orvis learning center, but, um, doing the second season, doing more advanced stuff. Um, I'm a little nervous cause we haven't finished it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we're going back in about another three weeks to do a lot of uh, serious shooting, both uh, for trout, bonefish, redfish. Um, and, you know, I'm nervous about getting the footage we need, but mm-hmm. um, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it's really, uh, you know, it sounds like fun, and it is, but it's also a lot of hard work uh, scripting these things and shot listing them and everything. But, do do um, you like the video more than the podcasting or writing or anything like Do you have a favorite? way of communicating uh no not really i i kind of enjoy them all i mean writing's hard work i don't i don't i don't most of the time i don't love the process of writing Mm -hmm. uh it's work it's real work but Mm. it's a way of making enough money to take a couple more fishing trips a year you know yeah (laughs) And uh, if people want to follow you and keep up with you, and maybe even try to find a way to get on your chocolate mailing list, what's the nah what's that no that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Um, probably Instagram uh, or the Orvis Fly Fishing Guy podcast, which is you know on on Spotify and mm-hmm. Stitcher and and uh, iTunes. Uh, but Instagram, I'm fairly active on Instagram, and I try to make it a that a teaching area as well. I, I did a few chocolate posts and I, I, I noticed that they didn't get as much engagement. So I don't really do any chocolate stuff anymore. <laughs> 
Well, I really appreciate the time and, and thanks for just sitting down with us today and helping us out as we start this podcast as well. Well, thank you for, uh, for letting me, uh, sound off here. It's, it's always a pleasure to be on the other side of the microphone (laughs) (laughs) and not having to prepare. Yeah. Well, it, it was great. So thank you for your time. Okay, Hunter. Thank you so much. Thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast. We hope that you enjoyed this interview. Please continue to spread the word. And as always, feel free to send us feedback by emailing hunter at captainscollective.com. Thanks for your support. This is the Captain's Collective.